My name's Eddie. Um, this is one of the, um, the list of very specific and very unique people that we're speaking to um, through the course of um, April and May. And today we are speaking to none other than writer extraordinaire, um, Rona Munro. Hello, Rona. Hello, Eddie. How are you? I'm very, very well. Thanks for spending the time with me this afternoon or whenever anyone's listening to this. Um, my, my first question to you is, is, is quite... I, I, I'm hoping it's not coming across facetious because it definitely doesn't mean it. You know, you've worked with Ken Loach. You know, you've got um, you've got awards from Giles Cooper Award. You've got the Susan Smith Blackburn Prize, an Evening Standard Award, and Writers Guild of Great Britain Award. You know, you've you've worked in multiple genres across multiple media, and yet when you look at your YouTube uh, or your um, Wikipedia page, the first thing it says is writer of Doctor Who. Yes. <laughs> You know, how, 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 how are you with that? You, I'm assuming you're okay with it. I, I am okay with it, but it is interesting. There was a point, I think, at one stage where um, I, I went in or someone else went in and bumped that down a bit. Uh -huh. And then the next time I checked Wikipedia, which, of course, I probably do about once every five years, it yeah. was back again. So I think, I think that's what Doctor Who fans consider mm -hmm. um, should be at the head of my list of credits. And mm -hmm. who am I to argue? Yeah. Um, it is probably my most notable credit in lots of ways. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, certainly it's, you've got the unique um, place of being the only person that's written for the new series and the classic series, which is yes, an so honour far. Indeed. Yep, so far. Yes. <laughs> I can't think of anyone else who would want to do it. Um, <laughs> but um, before we go on to Doctor Who, and it's, it's a personal thing for me, I saw um, Frankenstein and the Kings, I'm sure it was the Kings, um, about a year and a bit ago, just before the world went, the shot. Um, yeah. And I absolutely adored it. It was amazing. Oh, thank you. Was, That's so kind. I was literally in the front row. Um, wow. I had to talk my wife into go and see. We went to see The Exorcist kind of run about the same time. And um, she was a bit scared of that. But I thought Frankenstein as itself isn't, it's not known for being scary, really. It not comes under the horror genre. Um, Aye. What was your thinking? I, I, loved, I loved the fact that Mary Shelley is on stage all the way through it. And that was a very doctory performance from the girl who plays Mary Shelley, you know, to, to yeah, kind of tie yeah. in. What, what, was, what was the thinking around about doing Frankenstein? Um, right. I, I, yeah, that was Ailey Lone mm -hmm. um, that, you, that you saw doing it. Um, yeah, I think my thinking around it was um, because it's often talked about as the first science fiction novel mm -hmm. and you can make an argument that it is. And it was but it was written by a, you know, 18, 19 year old um, young woman and an extraordinary young woman at that. And the the one thing I felt I'd never seen in the hundreds, literally hundreds, if not thousands of versions of um, Frankenstein um, uh, is, was a, a version that made Mary Shelley, the author, visible as I think she was. Mm -hmm. So even I, I've seen what she's quite often portrayed as a, as a kind of um, um, slightly hysterical in, in the literal sense of that word, um, kind of frail um, creature, you know, sort of dominated by her biology in as much as that, you know, people speculate about whether the fact she'd lost a child was um, what inspired the idea of creating life um, or whether the fact that, you know, she had this terrible relationship with Shelley in which she was crazy in love with him and he wasn't faithful had kind of created her idea of, um, you know, Dr. Frankenstein himself. Mm. And it's all sort of really in as much as she's been made visible, she's sort of been made visible as a woman who is the victim of her biology and of her time and of being kind of oppressed by, you know, um, early 19th century patriarchal culture. Mm -hmm. 
And if you actually look at her and her life and her mother and the way she was raised and the things she did, she was not that. She was nobody's victim. She was an incredibly um, strong young woman. She did go through an awful lot of things in, you know, in terms of losing kids and having a relationship that was fairly challenging. But a lot of that, you know, was her choice. Mm. And she was trying to live in a revolutionary way. And, um, you know, some people say that um, Frankenstein, the book, was heavily edited by Shelley, who, of course, was a famous poet. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so amazingly well written. Um, in fact, the truth is more likely that the only reason we know Shelley's poetry is because she edited it after his um, um, early and untimely death mm -hmm. and pulled together all these kind of scraps of drug riddled um, stuff that he written on envelopes and stuff mm -hmm. and created the kind of body of poetry that we now know as Shelley's work. So I felt I wanted to imagine this very rebellious young character because she was, she was a, a political rebel. She broke all society's rules. She did things that we can still still consider shocking today. She wrote a, a best-selling novel at the age of 19, which is still a best-selling novel. Yep. She And she went on supporting herself as a woman in the early 19th century, purely by her own writing, brought up a family as a single mother on that and, uh, and you know, lived into her 50s. And for a women in the early 19th century to do all that is just unbelievable so I wanted the version that showed that you know in the in the in the book you have Frankenstein the creator mm. who's created the monster I wanted the version where you also have um, Mary Shelley the creator and you see that she is deciding to terrify you Yes. And deciding to write a book that people found extremely shocking because she did things like kill kids mm -hmm. and, um, you know, um, have um, debates about morality and social justice and God and all sorts of things that really were very shocking of its time. And she knew she was being shocking. So I wanted that very rebellious character on stage basically going, I'm going to terrify you now. Yeah. And that is what I know how to do. And here you go. Here's a monster coming at you. Mm -hmm. So that, yeah, sorry, it's a very long answer. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it, that if you look at the company she kept um, in Villa Diodati that day, that, you know, you've got Shelley, as you said, you had Lord Byron there as well, and Dr. Polidori, you know, yeah. and she's the one that stands out. That's extraordinary for, for a young woman to stand out amongst that kind of, you know, company. Well, she's certainly the one that if you want to talk about, um, if we were to talk about royalties, not that she got the, the kind of royalty deal she should have done mm -hmm. or would have got in the 21st century. But if you were to talk about royalties, she outsold all the rest of them by a substantial yeah. way. Um, you know, if she was still getting the royalties off, off that book and its many adaptations, she'd be a billionaire, wouldn't she? And I know it's not about monetary value, no. but I think in terms of power as a writer, yeah, she beat the lot of them, didn't she? Yep, I think as well. I, I always feel sorry for Polidori because the story that he wrote, The Vampire, w was basically Dracula 0.0. Yeah. And, you know, Bram Stoker comes along about 100 years later and, and nicks it off him. Yeah, you know? exactly. <laughs> yes, and I love was, that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I don't know whether you knew, just in another Doctor Who note, that um, Doctor Who did last season an actual episode called The Haunting of Villa Diodati, and it's set in that, that evening. Um, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Maxine been Anderton wrote it. Ah, right. There's been a lot of um, versions of that evening yeah. as well. Liz Lockhead, um, another fellow Scottish yeah. playwright, did mm -hmm. one. Um, Howard Brenton. Um, oh, loads of people. Yeah, it's yep. a it's a popular one. Yeah, Liz Lockhead's Dracula was the one that I saw in I saw in theatre as well. That's ah, it's, right. it's similar. It's almost like a companion piece to your own. Obviously, Dracula and Frankenstein always go together, but. I, was, I see the two of them as very similar. It's very minimum, um, you, you know, setting and stuff like that, but it's aye, it's, it's very aye. good as well. It's it's great. So and Well, it, I think there's another one going out. I think uh, Morna Young's just written a, a new uh, Dracula, I think. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong about that, but uh, that's the, that's the, the theatrical rumour yep. that I've heard. Well, they always come round again, don't they? That's the main yeah. the classics. Yeah. You'll always get them. But when you look at yourself with Frankenstein, obviously... The, the, the focus is on that on on um, you know Mary Shelley and that and you know and, 
but she's literally writing the story in front of us. And it's, it, it genuinely was, I was completely blown over by it. I genuinely was. I know it's only rough, you know, kind of been very sick of you, but I genuinely mean it. You know, and I felt that, you know, obviously with the focus being on the female character, then if you look at um, your work in Doctor Who, to kind of segue into that a bit, you know, Ace became the, the focus of survival, you know, Aye. with the Doctor. Be it. Now, I know that was the kind of, Andrew had that, was, was working on through that anyway, but but what was your take on Doctor Who when you come to that? How did you get the, the role or, or the, the job? What what happened? How do you start formulating that episode or, or the, the three episodes of survival? Um, well, I came to it because um, I went on a um, course at the BBC and was running to kind of encourage writers, stage writers to write for for um, uh, television. Mm-hmm. In fact, there was um, Vince O'Connell was on it, Winston Pinnock was on it. Uh, I can't remember the other people, but it was, you know, it was a, it was quite prestigious company um, mm-hmm. of, of kind of fellow thespians, as it were. Yep. And um, we... I met a whole bunch of script editors. That was one of the kind of days was a kind of networking talk to script editors. And Andrew was there. And of course, mm-hmm. I just went up to him and went, tell me, how do you write for Doctor Who? I'll do anything. And then I think he responded to my enthusiasm um, and very generously kind of gave me a shot at it mm-hmm. um, for, for that season that would, of course, become the, the last season of the classic Doctor Who. Yep. Um, and, and it was very much a conversation with him and um, I kind of, um, and John Nathan Turner was was obviously someone I met, but I didn't, I wasn't aware of, he was a producer, um, as I'm sure a lot of the listeners will know, um, but um, I wasn't really aware of him so much as a creative presence on it. Mm-hmm. It felt more like it was a conversation with myself and Andrew and working out what was possible. Um, and it, in th- at that time, because Doctor Who was sort of in the BBC on sufferance. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, a lot of people who were involved in that season have talked about this, yes. but it basically had been kept going by fan um, support mm-hmm. and just the amount of people that had been going, you can't cancel it, you can't cancel it, and sort of grudgingly got us another season, but they didn't want it and, and they certainly didn't want to pay for it. So everything was in a shoestring. Um, and we were just kind of meeting in a sort of battered BBC office in Shepherd's Bush and having conversations. And in some ways it was quite liberating mm-hmm. because there was no sense you had, there was no expectation. There was nothing you had to prove. You just had to try and make your ideas work for the minuscule budgets that we um, were actually allowed. Um, and the the idea, it, I think both times I've done Doctor Who, I do feel that people have said to me, what's your big idea? What's the thing that you believe in? What mm-hmm. do you want to be saying with these episodes? Which I think is one of the joys about Doctor Who is that it, it does allow a writer that kind of um, uh, empowerment, yes. really. Um, so as long as you are making it feel like it belongs in the in the who universe within that they actually want your big idea as a writer mm-hmm. um so for survival i suppose it's it's kind of i mean i've always been sort of uh, in an inadequate way trying to address kind of issues of social justice and human morality and stuff like that and and also i think wanted to write about our relationship to the natural world mm-hmm. and the plus positives and, and negatives in that. Um, so it really kind of, it just came out of, of those, those things. And then you're looking at a structure, a story that can, that can fit that kind of big concept as it were. Mm-hmm. You get people like um, other people I spoke to in the past, like Ben Aranovich, what have you, they, they kind of say that you get um, a bit of a shopping list with John Nathan Turner, and I'm, I'm pretty sure it was the same with Russell T and, and Stephen Moffat as well when it comes to writing. Were, were the master and people like Caelan Pace, and were, were those characters mm. you were told to write on, or, or did you have free? Did you think, I oh, know the master's good for that one? No, I think, oh God, I can't remember, Eddie. That's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> I remember being absolutely delighted that I got the master, mm-hmm. but I can't remember if I asked for him or whether I was told I could have him. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I think I was told I could have them. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I think that's the way that one went. Easily by a country mile, Ainley's best performance is the master as well. He's a lot more pared back in it. It was very arch previously, very pantomime sometimes. Oh, um, I suppose, yes, I hadn't thought of that. Yeah, yep. I can see what you mean. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Yep. A great performance. And you can see where that performance led on, you know, to, to kind of people at John Sim and maybe even Derek Jacobi probably more than anyone, you know, that we can see that kind of really kind of, that he's holding back a lot. He kind of, the violence that's in him from the cheetah planet, he's, he's kind of, he's, he's in control of it for the most part. You know, it's, mm. it's very interesting. It's a, Ainley is, I think he's in record as saying that it was his favourite take on the Master as well, you know. And, oh, wow, that's nice to know. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Two things he said, Terry, that he liked, he, he was pleased about in his life was cricket and Doctor Who. And, oh, um, wow. and, and then, he, I, I mean, he's been away a long time now, aren't he? You know, but I'm, I'm kind of, I can't remember exactly, but I'm sure he was he was pleased himself with with, with, um, with how, the, um, how Survival turned out. But when you look at Ace for Survival, she's very much a prototype new series companion, isn't she? You know, with it, like House and Estates and, you know, a single mum and all that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and I always think she's very, like, when I spoke to Sophie from my book, I said, you know, you were basically Rose Mark 1 and she, she was thrilled to bits to be, and she agrees by the way, she said, absolutely, I'm Rose Mark 1, you know. Um, so, so did, and, and you were the first person really to take her into that House and Estate kind of setting. As well, yes. Are you aware of that? Um, I was wasn't really at the time, mm-hmm. um, and the other thing, of course, is I'm a Scottish writer, and I don't know. I, I was told she came from Perryvale. Mm-hmm. I don't know Perryvale from yeah. all in the ground. Um, um, but I'd been, you know, the, I'd be doing an awful lot of community theatre and, and worked with community theatre groups in Belfast and in Glasgow and in. Um, uh, Wester Hills and uh, in Leeds and so you can imagine really rough mm-hmm. um, I know you think you're, if you remember um, what Edinburgh in particular was like yeah. um, you know the housing estates in Edinburgh yeah. back then they were really rough um, I mean I think uh, we had the hero- we were the heroin capital of Europe at, yes. th- at that stage I mean it was really really bad it's a train spotting country yes. really um, and that's I thought Perryville was like that because <laughs> I was just told housing estate and I went oh right oh so I, I kind of when I wrote it I was in a, and then when when I actually saw Perryville I went oh oh it's quite nice actually it's isn't quite it? suburban isn't it <laughs> yeah quite suburban I mean it worked fine uh-huh. it all worked fine and in a way I think because fortunately the actors the young actors had a far better idea of what it was they were rebelling against and mm-hmm. trapped by and you know pushing against that that the, you know in suburbia they were able to to make all the the drama still work even though i'd imagined them kind of you know rolling around in the waste ground with them mm. um, razor blades you know, yeah. <laughs> did you think did you know at the time i mean i think i know the answer to this question did you know at the time it was the last one i know that andrew said he went in and rewrote the the, the, the soliloquy that self has right at the very end but yeah no he, he had to because we, we didn't know we would we didn't know they were for sure they were going to cancel it, though I think we were afraid of that. Uh-huh. Um, and we didn't know what order they were going to air the episodes. Right. Mm-hmm. So when it was clear that the the it was mine was going to be the last one, I was actually out of the country. So um, Andrew felt, you know, well, if this is the last ever Doctor Who scene anyone's mm-hmm. going to see. It's got to have some kind of sign off. So he wrote that mm-hmm. um, soliloquy, which I often get credited for, um, yep. but it's no, it's not me. It's very, it's very in keeping with some of the doctor's um, language all the way through it, however, isn't it? It's, it's, it really is. It, yeah, no, I mean, he, very he knew his doctor, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so, uh, Sophie and I, the, one of the great thrills in my life um, was when I interviewed Sophie. Her and I um, repeated that the whole thing together. Oh, um, wow. And, and as, a, as an old fanboy, um, be sp- still my heart, I'm telling you, it was it was Because I started saying it, you know, there were words out there with the sky's burning, and she joined in, and we just oh, ended wow. up saying the whole thing, and it was uh, or something else. Well, unfortunately, that was written, that was in a written interview that ended up a written interview rather than a, a, a recorded one, but never mind. It's on a oh, what a shame, man. hard yeah. drive something on an old laptop, probably. And so, so you done survival you know you, you think Doctor Who's finished it you go on you do amazing work you know elsewhere you know, you know some of your stuff that you've done things like watch up down 
you know, um, obviously we mentioned Frankenstein, we've done Radio 4 dramas, your King James that you won the, the, the you know, the, the um, I think it was the Writers Guild for, for the, the King James series. It got played. Evening Standard, it was best Evening play Standard. for that as well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you've done all that and then suddenly Doctor Who appears again, was it 20 yeah. years later? Uh, oh God, uh, that is, I'm terrible on dates and I hate keeping track. <laughs> it was a long time so later, 89 yes. To 20, so one was 89 and um, Eaters of Light was 2016, I want to say. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, so it was so, just, yeah, it was just coming out of the James Place yeah. and that was the next thing I did, yeah. yeah. So how did that um, come along? What, what, what was your thinking? Um, oh, Stephen Moffat, God love him. Uh -huh. God love him, Stephen Moffat. Clearly... Um, had because he's a fanboy, isn't he? Mm -hmm. And um, he had such respect for writers of the classic series. It was mm -hmm. really quite touching, I think, um, to encounter that because you know he's come along and he's made the new um, series this huge juggernaut for the BBC, mm -hmm. this huge successful thing, and uh, he could have quite easily been. Um, quite dismissive of those of us that had been labouring away on the old kind of dusty original. But, mm. you know, he was so, um, he was just, I, I think it, he wanted to work with, as a, you know, um, people that had written for the classic series. I think that was an ambition of his. And I'm, I think I was fortunate that he liked um, survival as a episode, um, series of episodes. So, um, yeah, he just um, approached me. And um, I think, I think the James Place helped because mm. they got a big profile. Um, but I think we were already in discussion to do one when that came up. Um, I'm trying to remember how it happened. I know I tried to get back on Doctor Who earlier and it not happened. Um, that was in the Chris Chibnall um, point. And I think when Stephen came on board, I can't remember if someone went to him or he came to but anyway it was about the time mm. that the James Place were doing very very well um, and I think I got my agent got an approach about that time to see if I'd be interested in doing another one. Uh -huh. It's I think when you look at the classic series writers you know who are still writing today you know um, if you look at yourself survival became a segue into what became the new adventure books um, and the big finished plays and, you know, and from then that, that kind of segued into the new series. You, you were ov obviously going to be the natural choice, I think, you know, because you, you were the person who, you know, when you talk about, you know, the kind of the, the, the feminine writing in it, you know, the feminist writing in it, when you talk about how you deal with ACE, you know, with social issues, how you deal with the planet, you know, all those things, particularly even today, are, are so to the forefront of how the BBC work and how Doctor Who is, you know, pushing those agendas really to the front. So I think aye, for, for me, aye. for you to, to, you know, to get something like the of Light, it, it was a no-brainer. I'm surprised to see you, you know, beforehand. Well, you know, mind you, um, when we sat down for the read-through, um, Stephen Moffat said, well, um, hold on, you know, basically hold on to your seats, folks, uh -huh. because the last time we did our own Monroe script, we were off the air for 15 <laughs> years. So it's... <laughs> it's uh, you could say I killed the franchise, but yeah, no, they let me back in the room. <laughs> One of the questions I'm sure you, you've been asked before, but I, I, I've been asked to ask it by about 25 people that I told was not here. Um, obviously, as Terence Dix, years and years and years ago, one of the, you know, the all-time greatest writers of Doctor Who, said that he doesn't write different Doctors. So when he particularly he famously wrote more for the, third, the second, the third, and the fourth Doctor. He just writes the Doctor, and the mm. actor puts a spin on it. Now, you're in Aye. a unique position to have written for Sylve and Peter Capaldi, who are so different. You know, yeah, what yeah. Did, you, did you have a different way or did you just write the Doctor? I just wrote the Doctor, but interestingly yep. enough, one of the comments I got on my first draft is, ah, you're writing classic Doctor. Ah. Um, and, and that led to a discussion about what the difference was. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting. It's the... the um, the difference in terms of my writing that they settled on or, or made sense to me was that the, the, the new doctor, for want of a better word, is a lot more proactive right. and a lot more um, the protagonist of every story. Mm -hmm. Whereas with Classic Who, and, and you know, particularly with mine, as you say, Ace was a big focus of it. So mm -hmm. the companions 
quite often became protagonists. And you can see even in the Eaters of Light, that was, they still kind of let me go that way mm-hmm. because it's very much, you know, the Doctor and Bill are separated. Yeah. Bill's got her own story. Bill's got her own trajectory through the story and then they're reunited. But that's actually um, not something that happened so much, I think, in the in the revived mm-hmm. um uh, who uh, episodes so yeah mm. I thought that was interesting but in my head you're absolutely right in my head I was just writing the doctor because the doctor is oh. the doctor exactly. and you couldn't define what it is but you know what it is mm-hmm. and in terms of character so I think in terms of story structure um, I was probably echoing a pattern that I remembered from way back mm-hmm. but in terms of of the character yeah, no, it's just the doctor, isn't it? Uh-huh. And they're um, both Scottish as well, uh, so you know that helps. There's definitely a, more than one thread there. But I'm going to ask you a question that it's it's kind of because of who you are rather than you know anything else, and it's my kind of take on the Jodie Whittaker's doctor, the female doctor. Mm. Um, now, I understand entirely, you know, you know why you know you would want a female representation as a doctor. You know, you get to the 21st century, and why would you not? But from a technical point of view, um, from a writer's point of view, I always find it quite awkward because I think having a female doctor diminishes a female companion and it makes the dynamic quite difficult to, to operate properly because normally what you get is you get a very strong, feisty, you know, ace or bill or whoever it is. And, you know, and they can sometimes, they can chastise or move or pull the doctor in different ways. But when the doctor's already female, that kind of breaks the, the, the way you would want to write a strong female if you've got another strong female pushing them out. Does that make sense? You it know? does, but I also think that's quite a 20th century analysis of gender. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, so I absolutely. think one of the things that we're, you know, and as, as you said um, at, the, at the start of this, we're kind of of an age. Mm-hmm. I think one of the things I'm learning, uh, you always know, don't you? When, you? when you're young yourself, you go, there's going to be something. There's going to be something yeah. that the next generation's doing that I'm going to be going, I don't even get that, what you do. <laughs> and, and I think for our generation, especially those of us that, think we're lefty liberals Mm -hmm. what's happening with gender politics and you know lgbt um q plus and trans um identification and all that is very challenging Mm -hmm. but also i think in terms of human beings um learning what it is to be human and what isn't isn't intrinsic Mm -hmm. to gender is is probably going to be really liberating and really rather wonderful so I think I know what you're saying in terms of um particularly the kind of tropes we associate with with um the, you know Doctor Who narratives or dynamics between male okay. and female characters but I think that's all in a melting pot now and I, I, it'd be really interesting to see where it goes now we've got a female mm-hmm. doctor it's kind of all bets are off. Yep. You could have a you could have a gender fluid doctor. In yep. the sense, I think you've always got a gender fluid doctor, yes. and I think you've always got a, a doctor that's not defined by age, race, gender, any any things. Because he's you know at the end of the day, they if you were going to you know get that uh-huh. version, they the doctor. Um, is not um, is is not even human. Um, yes. So well, I know there's a whole debate. You know what, what proportion? Blah blah. blah. I well, don't know. Not, I can't remember what the date is. Now apparently. I don't oh, we're you, not even time lord now. Okay, you, right. You saw the end of the last series. I don't know if you have. No, I um, haven't. I've got. Um, do you know what? I've uh-huh. got certain lockdown. Um, sort of box set heaps uh-huh. that, are, but, um, that are sitting there waiting on me to do in a one earth. So, um, yeah. Well, I won't I'm spoil a, it for you. But... Okie doke. Um, but, um, oh, gosh. Certainly, oh, you oh. probably have to watch it now. <laughs> oh, I do find it really hard. Like, again, it's probably an age thing. I do find it really hard if I need to be on top of where the canon has got yes. to. And, I, and I, I sort of, there's a bit of me that goes, oh, I can't be arsed. Yep. You know, it's it's the doctor, and um, I, does this story work? Mm-hmm. But um, I also know there's a joy in being steeped in the canon, and then being able to analyze everything in those terms. But it can cause enormous grief, can't it? Yeah. Oh. Because if you're steeped in the canon and mm-hmm. you believe it to be one thing, and then they mess with it, yeah. Oh my God, I'm I sort of avoid that grief. <laughs> oh, they've not saying? just messed with it; they have chucked a grenade into it. It's been it's expanded the mythos, shall we say. Um, last year, one of the episodes was The Haunting of Villa Diodati. And personally, for me, 
it's easily the best, you know, since um, Capaldi left. And, uh, you know, for just in my own opinion, it's oh, it's a right. great episode. And Maxine Anderton wrote that as well. You know, right. so that's got your Shelleys and your Byrons and all that in it. And it's got a, a kind of Cyberman in it too. So it's worth, that is definitely worth a watch. That That's a great episode to, to, to jump oh, in. It's right. quite we'll near do. the end of yeah. season 12. So you could jump in and just watch the last two and you wouldn't, you wouldn't miss much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to say that in a bad way, but that's that's probably where you need to go to save you watching right. it all. But, um, so, so um, you know, Eaters, let's go back to Eaters Light just um, for a wee while. That's a very different story from survival, isn't it? It's, it, it's you know, it's, what, what was your thinking? Was it deliberately very different? Were you given a steer for it to be different? Or did you just have a different story to tell? Um, I think, from, see, from my point of view, it's similar in that it, it feels rooted in a landscape uh-huh. and in a relationship to a landscape. So that was yeah, course, very much common to both of them. And then I think... Um, we did have a little brainstorm about stories that I was drawn to. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I said Romans, um, um, you know, Stephen kind of lit up and went, oh, yeah, we like Romans. Let's okay, do Romans. Romans. Yeah, um, yeah. So, and of course, the Ninth Legion, the, the, the loss of the Ninth Legion was something that fascinated me as a child because if one, depending on which version of events you go with, one version of it is that the Ninth Legion vanished round about where I grew up uh, mm-hmm. near Stonehaven up in the, mm-hmm. the northeast uh, and the Battle of Mons Grapius w- was up there um, which was the big battle between um, the Romans and the indigenous population um, and I kind of I, yeah I, I sort of so I wanted to tell that history mm-hmm. and I wanted I do love unexplained history and giving it an explanation so a big chunk of unexplained history is that there are these um, Pictish um, stones. The Picts were the people who were in that part of Scotland, um, what is now Scotland, at the time the Romans made their way that far north. We know virtually nothing about them. They Mm -hmm. kind of like uh, vanished probably um, mainly by subsequent kind of ethnic groups coming in and they just kind of blended with them and they, uh-huh. their own culture gradually dissipated but also because the Romans gubbed a hell of a lot of them um, but it means that their culture whatever it was has become almost completely invisible mm-hmm. they left behind these stones with all these symbols on them and nobody knows what the symbols mean and the, the, the most common explanation is oh it's people's surnames you know that just means but you look at them and go well why is that someone's surname? Mm-hmm. Doesn't make... So I looked at the symbols and I thought, right, I'm going to make the pit. There's a thing that they call the Pictish beast. Mm-hmm. Um, and I thought, right, I'm going to make the Pictish beast the monster. And all the stones, there's the whole thing about stones being placed for in particular places. So the light of the solstice, you know, when the, it's the shortest day or the longest day, uh-huh. it will hit the stone. And that whole idea that whoever these people were, and this dates back, predates the Picts by a long way you know the idea that stones have been used to have that relationship with light and the mm-hmm. movement of the sun so I thought well I'm going to bring all this together and you're going to have a creature that actually eats the light mm-hmm. and um, that, that all the other symbols are the things you need to be able to defend yourself against this creature that eats the light so that you know they have the the mirrors there's this thing on the Pictish stones it's like a mirror symbol and I went right that's the doctor's going to make that into the, the the this is what you need to defeat the monster and you know so it 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 was basically looking at Pictish symbol stones and looking at what all the pictures were and then piecing together um a story out of that mm-hmm. but one of my biggest regrets is one of the the, the um most famous kind of images is of this giant bull and I had this herd of giant highland cattle in my script and it was like no you're not having that and I was like can I have one cat no you're not having that no no it's like you know I mean nobody was even making eye contact with me the line producer was just kind of going no no that's not happening Rona no you're not having a highland cow because there might be talk Stephen Moffat into the mine mine on and the mine on that mine Nine, nine oh yeah, nine. yeah, yeah! Uh, I should have gone there, uh, shouldn't I? Yeah, he, yeah. He would probably have gone for that in season ten. I think he's he's kind of. Oh, yeah. It's a very underrated season, I think, because it comes at the end of Capaldi's run, and there's been some big, massive stories. And I think Bill yes. Pearl Mackey is extraordinary as, as a companion. Such a waste oh, to only have one season, you know. Yes. It's, it's such a great season. 
and maybe yeah. my favourite. And Capaldi just is. Uh, uh, you, if you watch kind of the other Doctors, and Sil was a great example of this. You know, kind of leaning into the character and becoming more more comfortable with it. Capaldi in season ten is just he just oozes the Doctor. It's just so yeah. natural for him. What, He's what born to play that part, oh, wasn't he? He absolutely. really was. He knocked it back or something. Was there a story of him knocking it back in 1996? Um, oh, I've not heard that story. No. So I might be getting this totally wrong. But, but there was something where he either knocked it back or he didn't. I think he didn't go for the, the, the and that's what it was. He didn't go for the edition, the one that Paul McGann got. Because right. he said if he didn't get it, he would never have been able to live with himself because he's a massive oh. fan. So that, that was the story. So, so he didn't go for the, he was asked by his agent to go for the, the and I think they were interviewing every British, you know, actor around. And um, Oh, that makes sense. And yeah. So Paul and got actually, the, God, and if he'd got that, he would never have got, you know, the 12th Doctor, would he? No, that's off. Yeah. That's true. Having said that, you know, the, the, there's talk now of other actors coming back and playing, you know, like maybe David or Matt, particularly those two, maybe coming back and playing the Doctor again. Um, but I don't know. It's it's all up in the air just now. What's going to happen? I Jodie leaves at the end of this season, so um, right. the, the new doctor's en route, as they say. He's a coming, <laughs> as Matt used to famously say. So what what's, what have you got coming up? What's happening? I know that um, Frankenstein is the last thing you had in theatre, wasn't it? Am I right? But yeah, it was the last of- thing. It it was um, yeah. Yeah, and that was just, it just finished just yep. before last locked, uh, the first lockdown. So, yeah, I mean, in theatre terms, nobody's doing anything. Um, I think England's starting to open up now, mm-hmm. and hopefully Scotland will follow suit. Um, I've got, um, hopefully, um, going to do more James Place, mm-hmm. um, and hope that would be next year. Mm-hmm. But that's not, con- it, it, it's very difficult times for theatre. It's uh, nothing is certain. So I'm, I mean, you can tell I'm very cautious. I think Aye, I'm sort of reasonably confident, but at the same time, just don't want to jinx anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've had, um, I've been really lucky actually in lockdown. I had a lot of um, screen work, so that's all at different stages. Mm-hmm. Um, and hopefully, some of it will actually get greenlit on a on a screen uh, in the in next year sometime. Fantastic. And I know obviously you've done a lot of radio for dramas. You've never done a big finish, have you? About, did I miss a big? Finish? No, no, no. I haven't. No. I'm surprised. Have you met Nicholas Briggs? You want me to introduce you? <laughs> uh, no, I think it's it's sort of uh, it's weird in terms of writing Doctor Who. Uh-huh. I think it, the first time it was just something I desperately wanted to do, Aye. Um, and by the and at the second time when it was offered to me again, it was just like I was so on this. But I think unless I was, I'm at a place in my life where I think I've got a strong idea or. I really feel I could do it justice mm-hmm. and it's it's sort of not something I want to go near do you know what I mean yeah, no I understand entirely yeah totally um I think that I'm as I'm, I'm a graduate of Glasgow Uni for Scottish history so your James plays are, are you know big for me and I'm if you're doing more of them next year I think I'll be queuing up to, to oh get brilliant them. oh yes James fourth James fourth hopefully coming to a theatre near you next autumn well, we hope we well, really hope and then um I think the plan is to is you know because we did a trilogy the first time and the uh-huh. plan is to bring them out one at a time um mm-hmm. and then you know in theory mm-hmm. one could do all seven because of course you've got Mary Queen of Scots in there um mm-hmm. Uh, so that's that's the big ambitious mm. arrogant dream that I may or may not get to do before I die. There was an episode of Doctor Who um, season eleven, I think it was called Witchfinders, and it has James the Sex in it. Yes, kept... I know, and I didn't like that James the Sex. Mm-hmm. I, I didn't like that James the Sex. I went, no, he's not like that. <laughs> For me, every time they mention James that's how the English want you to think he was, but he wasn't like that. <laughs> exactly. And I just kept going because they kept calling him James the First, and I kept going the Sex. Ah, uh, <laughs> yes, I know. And all I know. the way through it, and my wife's going, "Will you shut up?" And I said, no, because he's James the Six. You know, James. Yeah, the exactly. I'm a big you, but he's James the Six. Yeah, he was James getting... Six before he was James the First. Exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> properly annoyed by that. I don't know why. Anyway, Rona, thank you so much. I know it's taken a bit of time to get us together, but I'm really. Oh, not at all. It's been absolutely lovely. I do really enjoy talking to you. I'm glad we we finally managed to get together. Well, thanks very much, Rona. Cheers, and no hope worries. We'll speak again soon. Take care. Okay, doke. Talk bye-bye. soon. Bye.